Hello, and welcome to American Amnesia. I am your host, Cliff Garner. And uh, I want to return to uh, the idea of the uh, new paradigm and uh, actually go over my friend uh, uh, Juan's uh, comment a little closer just so you can see what he's talking about and understand what he means and thereby uh, focus in a little better on what I mean by it. But first of all, let's start with what a paradigm is. Uh, I have a my good old-fashioned uh, American Heritage Dictionary here. This is, I think, two, uh, 2008 edition. Uh, and uh, a paradigm is a specific thing, or, or a type of thing, I should say. And what it says here, uh, definition one, one that serves as a pattern or model. Um, so pattern or model, right? Image of something. Um, a set or list of all inflectional forms of a word or of one of its grammatical categories. So the paradigm of irregular verbs. Uh, so when we speak of linguistics, we can also talk about a paradigm being a specific uh, uh, list or a pattern of a, of a, a grammatical element. Um, and that's actually uh, one of the older versions of the uh, word. Uh, third, uh, a set of uh, assumptions, concepts, values, and practices that constitutes a way of viewing reality for the community that shares them, especially in an uh, intellectual discipline. And the word comes from Greek, uh, basically para, alongside, right? It's in parapsychology. And then de cunai, uh, to show. So to show alongside of, right? Uh, it, it's actually a, a Comparison is where you go with that. And it talks about the usage here. And it says, uh, Paradigm first appeared in English in the 15th century, meaning an example or pattern, and it still bears this meaning today. Their company is a paradigm of the small tech firms that have recently sprung up in the area. Uh, for nearly 400 years, paradigm has also been applied to the patterns of inflections that are used to support, sort the verbs, nouns, and other parts of speech of a language into groups that are more, e more easily studied. Since the 1960s, paradigm has been used in science to refer to a theoretical framework. As when La Nobel laureate David Baltimore cited the uh, work of two colleagues that really established a new paradigm for our understanding of the causation of cancer. Thereafter, researchers in many different fields, including sociology and literary criticism, often saw themselves as working in or trying to break out of paradigms. Uh, applications of the term in other contexts show that it can sometimes be used to... Uh, uh, more loosely to explain the prevailing view of things. The usage panel splits down the middle on these non-scientific uses of paradigm. 52% disapprove of the sentence, the paradigm governing international competition and competitiveness has shifted drastically in the last three decades. So the, the agreement on the word itself is... Uh, uh, pretty much non-existent. This is generally true of about anything in linguistics, uh, language, and uh, usage. Um, that there is a uh, very little agreement and a lot more disagreement. Uh, of course, that is, of course, an academic thing. Academics like to disagree. They like to nitpick. But the word paradigm as a, as a word of a, an overall pattern of uh, things that go into... Uh, uh, a perception or as a uh, model of, uh, of what we consider as uh, a, a reality, uh, I think those are pretty fair ways of, uh, of uh, looking at this word, especially in the way we're using it here. Uh, basically, when we talk about the paradigm of 
in, in which we we're speaking of, we were talking about a political reality. Um, and when we, we discuss that, what is the paradigm? Well, generally speaking, you know, you're looking at a two, two-party system in the U.S., uh, and it, it's organized on uh, conservative to liberal, uh, left-right uh, dichotomy, in which that the center is often non, non uh, well, well, it's basically negligible. It, its influence is uh, divided into the two parts. Uh, this uh, this Manichaean dark and light. Uh, outlook of the world uh, that comes uh, from having the two-party type system. Uh, that that kind of a framework it was always a an imposition uh, that has been made uh, on on U.S. politics in particular. Uh, if you examine the politics of uh, most other areas, uh, they have had a, a number of parties in the parliamentary systems. As a rule, uh, now that is as a rule, not uh, as a necessity, but as a rule. Uh, although they've all used the left-right paradigm, <laughs> you see where that that goes. This this whole this whole left-right continuum as a um, model of political uh, reality has been in place actually. Uh, since, I, I don't think it was in place before, but I do believe that it was put in place uh, uh, after the, uh, the Napoleonic Wars. And so that you had, on the far left, you had groups like uh, the anarchists and communists, right, the revolutionaries, the Jacobins originally, and then they would come down, to, coming towards the center from the far left uh, to, the, uh, to the more moderate types, the liberals, right? The moderate uh, leftists would be liberal, uh, free thinkers, uh, things of that sort. To the center, where they uh, looked at a balanced uh, view of things, or actually they kind of represented stasis. A lot of times, sometimes they just ended up in the middle, uh, right there in the middle of the road, waiting for people to run over them. And then you had the uh, right, which began with the conservatives, who were generally uh, like the liberals on their, their counterparts on the left, who would be uh, trying to preserve the older system, or at least uh, to slow the rate of change, as it were. And then to the right of them were those that were called reactionaries who were trying to uh, react to situations and bring things to a, a halt or maybe reverse the trend to go back to the past. And then to the right of them would be the more extreme types, which in Napoleon's time would have been, uh, the, for one thing, the Bonapartists who were trying to bring back Bonaparte. And to the right of them would be the old uh, Bourbonists who were trying to bring back the king. Uh, eventually those two would uh, kind of meld together, uh, especially with the uh, intermarriages of the Bonapartes with the noble families of Europe. And the... Uh, well, anyway, that, that would be where, where it, it ended up. Now, it, as time progressed, it, this this... Paradigm mutated, but it really didn't change a whole lot. Uh, you still had uh, uh, the left to right, the left uh, instead of uh, Girondists and uh, uh, the Jacobins, or ja yeah, Jacobins on the left. Uh, then you would end up with the Communists, the Anarchists uh, to the left of them, and uh, then uh, it, it would progress towards the center uh, you would have socialists of different stripe social democrats to the right of the uh the revolutionaries and then you would have uh the uh liberals who of course would maintain 
Uh, it probably a, a stricter business model, but uh, but still nonetheless, um, you know, starting to get into social uh, development, social welfare, and that sort of thing. The welfare state would emerge from that that marriage, uh, and uh, and then in the center would be basically people who were upholding a loosely capitalistic uh, or uh, a- after social democracy pretty much won over in Europe and in America, <laughs> which it did, uh, and in other places in the world, that uh, that, that basically the center would uh, generally uphold the, the welfare state itself. Uh, conservatives... Uh, actually would uphold it as well uh it would be to the right of them that uh that that was not the case now now you're wondering where i I would put in the uh the nazis well as far as they were concerned they were anti-marxist but they were revolutionaries and they were socialists you know, everybody wants to say, well, they didn't do socialism right. Well, nobody has. Uh, if you listen to socialists, the universal excuse for socialism and, and its failures is that nobody does it right. Um, well, sorry. It just tends to be the way it works. You put everything all in one one place in the middle where it's uh, collected up and uh, put there in one place. The tendency is to steal. And that is what uh, the people that uh, get their hands on that money tend to do. They tend to, to keep their hands on it one way or another, or they give it to their friends. That's human nature. Human nature has been very cruel to socialism as a doctrine. Uh, there is uh, uh, social democracy does work. Um, but it also has its serious problems, and one of the serious problems is waste. Uh, the waste comes from the people that that have their hands on the money and what they do with it. And often it is given to their pals. Simple. Very simple. And it, it gets frittered away and lost. Uh, we should be talking about a trickle-down effect to the poor. Uh, do the poor get some of it? Yes. Does it help them? Yes. Is it good? I think that actually uh, maintaining the welfare state is a good thing, uh, but at the same time it does require a rather stringent exercise of law to make sure that it isn't frittered away by the idiots that that end up getting their sticky fingers on the money. There you go. Um... So, anyway, the main paradigm has been left to right. I think that that is changing. Um, I think it has been changing for some time. Uh, we're, we're starting to look at the left-right paradigm as being inadequate to describe uh, political processes and uh, pro- political uh, viewpoints and beliefs. And that this this has uh, come from the fact that uh, for quite some time now, uh, the ideologies of politics have been just uh, basically um, stagnating. We really haven't had any new political thinking uh, in quite some time. Uh, the the philosophical underpinnings of uh, fascism, socialism, communism... Capitalism, and those all occurred in the 17 and 1800s. And that uh, very little has developed since. Uh, I think uh, maybe uh, the ideas of corporatism, which act technically are fascist, uh, uh, were further developed by Peter Drucker, and, uh, and both parties uh, have. Uh, made adjustments into that direction but uh, but apart from uh, this whole arising of a uh, uh, a middle management uh, corporate uh, structure i suppose structural change uh, maybe we could even call it a reform uh ha- has been pretty much worked its way through and it is pretty much uh pretty much been exhausted as far as its creative uh, 
capabilities. Uh, it played into the the concepts of globalism that uh, had been in in place. Uh, good grief, probably since the 1300s, uh, maybe longer. Um, and basically, what you're seeing is uh, that the idea of a, of a one world government. I think has pretty much uh, played its way out. I don't think we see a whole lot new coming from it. Uh, the The UN, which was uh, the baby of the League of Nations, which uh, comes from ideas of uh, of uh, the of the empire of. Uh, um, of uh, Rome uh, being reestablished. I, I think that all these concepts have uh, pretty much been milked for all they're worth. And uh, if you if you look at what the United Nations stands for, it, it really stands for nothing. It, it has no real purpose. It has no real power. Uh, when it is used as a peacekeeping... Uh, um, mechanism. I, it, it's been a failure. Uh, I, I think that we need to re um, rethink all of that, and letting uh, letting the UN die on its own. I think is probably uh, uh, actually kind, uh, maybe too kind. Uh, as far as it goes, uh, it really does nothing uh, it just gives people a place to scream and yell at, it, at the u.s and basically we're the ones giving them the place to do it and putting the money in for them to do it to us so i, I think it's time to let it go i've thought that for a long time now so at any rate uh i it, it but it's it's a dead horse that we keep beating uh, it got built up again by uh, uh clinton to uh uh, to Bush too, to uh, uh, Obama, and Obama has probably uh, dragged it to the point where it really isn't going to go much further. Uh, it, you know, we look at what's been going on in Africa and uh, and the peacekeeping things that have gone on there. They they've done more harm than good. So I think that they're about done. But the paradigm uh, basically has been this left and right thing. And uh, Juan and I, uh, I miss talking to Juan. Uh, he and I were, uh, we are good friends. And uh, we were roommates in Istanbul for quite a while. And uh, we, we talked very often about uh, this idea of a new, a new way of looking at uh, politics. And this left and right thing. It's pretty well played out. Uh, what, what we're getting, is, as he would put it, is instead of being horizontal, uh, this direction, is we're looking at it more from a vertical one. Uh, we're finally addressing class. And I think that that's really where it needs to go. Uh, is there class in America? We don't like to look at that in America. We like to deny the existence of the idea of class. Uh, but but it, it's something that the rest of the world is extremely conscious of. And they, they've, uh, they've also been running away from talking about it lately, which I, I'm finding really interesting to see that from Europe, uh, that, that these ideas of uh, class are no longer... Uh, uh, valid and it's I think because that they're trying to through the EU they have been trying to uh, uh, kind of Americanize their thinking it, which is really ironic because uh, the uh, Democrats who uh, uh, consider themselves the liberals are actually Euro Eurocentric in their thinking uh, isn't that ironic uh, so you, you have this uh, this Class consciousness has actually arisen in America that wasn't there before. Uh, this is why when we talk about populism, 
you know, which loosely is uh, considered a, a concept of the will of the people, uh, the people's choice. What do the people want? The people will get what they want, right? Well, well, populism, uh, in fact, the word uh, popular, of course, is uh, related, but it, these all come from uh, the Latin word uh, populus, which means people. It comes from the people. What are the people thinking? Where are they going? And one of the basic uh, ideas underlying populism, uh, and my, my book here, uh, this... Uh, Revolt of the Elites really goes into this quite a bit, and uh, and, and I will uh, do some references to this in the future. Uh, but but according to Lash and uh, uh, a lot of people who have uh, studied populism as a potential movement in America, which now we see with the Trump election, that populism, the concept underlying populism, is one of respect. The idea is that we are equals. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter what your job is. If you are the uh, CEO of the company, that you are in, in, as far as the law is concerned, you're equals before the law. And it doesn't matter about your money. That the person who's on top is only there because of the people on the bottom. And that the relationship between the two should be one of respect. Respect from the person on the top to the person on the bottom. And also the respect of the lower to the higher as well. That we recognize that we all have a, a place within society that is valid and, and it is uh, honorable. Oh, oh, imagine that. And when you go back and you look at the uh, original uh, populist movement, that is what you're looking at when, when you get there. And, and the, the idea was that no matter who you are, if you were a citizen, you were, you, there were things that were expected of you to contribute. And because of that, that you were due a certain amount of respect from other people and the government. This is, this is what underlies the, the, uh, the, the idea behind populism. Uh, and all the books that I've read uh, that talked about a true populist movement would refer to this kind of concept. Now, Lash also proposes a second uh, uh, political, philosophical idea that he terms as communitarianism. And the underlying idea of communitarianism, which is not a necessarily an opposition at all to populism, but, but is rather a different type of emphasis. And he saw as another potentially reforming movement. And I think the Democrats should very seriously start waking up and stop, stop whining about their problems now and trying to avoid the problem, face the facts, and reform along those lines. And, and it would probably be a very good fit for them. <coughs> because what it is, is, is the idea of reestablishing the community. Both, both political philosophies would, in one sense or another, go back to the values that the people uh, actually share. And the communitarian type of an ideal would, would emphasize those shared values and would emphasize also the interdependence of people upon one another. Now, when we, we talk about populism, we, we often might get diverted into extremes of uh, individualism. Now, that need not be the case. Uh, we're not necessarily talking about a rugged individualism, but we're rather talking about the fact that each person is personally responsible and uh, can reap the rewards of correct and prosperous uh, endeavor. Uh, there's nothing wrong with uh, re reaping rewards. Uh, the, the idea was that those rewards would be preserved when... Uh, 
the populist party uh, started up, and uh, what was his name? Uh, the lawyer. Um, oh goodness. Uh, but when when the great proposition that they made was the graduated income tax, and that the idea was that that a person would pay according to how much they had made, this would be what they should give back. And what we had in the days of, of the populist party was the rich not paying their fair share of the taxes. They were. You know, this is this was uh, post uh, Civil War uh, era, and uh, so you you had uh, the the Gilded Age, in which the railroads boomed, and then the uh, uh, continued prosperous uh, uh, times, in which uh, you know there, there was just a lot of money made, and uh, and it was high times until the Depression. Um, although there were some smaller depressions that, that hit on the way. And a lot of that was because that, that there was no uh, regulating of uh, the trusts and things of this nature. Uh, and, and that's where uh, a person like Teddy Roosevelt, who became so important, was that he was busting the trusts, that he was uh, breaking down the big corporations and, uh, and then... Uh, furthermore, uh, that 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 FDR was breaking down the big bankers. Uh, the, these these are forces that within a capitalist society that if they are not controlled, threaten to, to undo all the good of the capitalist uh, 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 venture. Uh, well, I shouldn't say venture. Uh, the, the capitalist society uh, and and what it is trying to accomplish. Uh, and and you, all you need to do is do a cursory reading of Adam Smith to know that the, the, the there is a certain size of business uh, within the country and within the culture that becomes deleterious to the uh, the freedom and the uh, economic development that comes with uh, with the capitalist uh, system. So that this is a, a very important thing to uh, keep track of and, and uh, to, to regulate. So, so when Juan writes here, uh, he's not so convinced that what we're seeing is the new paradigm as such, but rather the death throes of the old paradigm. Uh, he, he's saying that, that we're seeing the, the old paradigm more clearly than we are the new. Uh, the, the shape that it's taking is not clear yet okay and and to some degree i i agree with him on this um it, it has it been supplanted by the new paradigm not yet it's still in the process of becoming uh the new paradigm has finally asserted itself it has been kept down uh the obama years uh with the uh uh the fact that he was never uh that the president was never challenged in the least by by the press, but was actually uh, not very successful as a, a leader, uh, really tells you that something else was going on uh, during his time. And, and, and there's a reason why that the situation in uh, this book that was written in 1994 uh, prior to the death of uh, Christopher Lash. There's a reason why the situation has remained static all this time. The, the, that our, our system has stagnated for, uh, for 20 years. That is what is really at stake here. Uh, and that's the reason why the, this book is still valid. So, so that the new paradigm has just now finally asserted itself. It tried to under Obama. It really tried to under Bush, but Bush, uh, Bush uh, had had a, had a real opportunity, and he he's not only squandered the opportunity uh, to uh, actually uh, bring the globalist vision to fruition. He could have actually brought it to fruition had 
had they treated uh, Iraq in a different manner than they did, and to have been more concerned about the bringing about of a uh, a successful statehood, actually a successful statehood within a globalist framework in which there were no borders. So you see, I bought into the, these ideas of the neocons because I, like Christopher Hitchings, saw that there was a potential of this, this globalist ideal being attained. And he saw it as a means of maybe bringing about freedom through the destruction of religion. I didn't see it as a destruction of religion that would be freedom, but rather by successfully overcoming the dictatorships of the world and bringing about a, a, a uh, more democratic and more equal and more uh, just and fair Middle East with peace that we could have entered into a type of a golden age uh, and globalism would have attained everything that it said it would. Well, rather than do that, the bankers got greedy and they started seeing, seeing things as a way of actually going about conquering other countries. That, and, and, and we saw that with uh, George Soros and what he was doing with places like the Ukraine. And uh, with uh, with Romania and with uh, all the little states that that uh, Yugoslavia was fractured into, and 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 and, and other places, the, the exploitation of the situation with the chaos and everything else, and the the amount of money really to be made by these entities, these economic entities, and these actually hidden uh, entities. Uh, of, a, of a less legal nature that were benefiting from uh, the, the movement of people without regulation of the human market. You know, you think about that. That these people had a very huge stake in, in, in actually maintaining the chaos that came out of the, uh, out of the ruination of places like Afghanistan and Iraq. And not only that, the, the fluid borders with the U.S. These 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 people and entities, some of them some of them quasi secret, even uh, and in fact even uh, criminal, had a stake in, in maintaining more of, more of a chaos rather than allowing globalism to actually succeed. Even though that that was their their own personally sworn objective to do, they betrayed it in order to make more capital out of it. So what you what you have, and and what I got to see very closely by being in uh, Turkey, was the fact that that the system that they they were saying that they were working for was falling apart. Because they they didn't want to bring it to fruition, they they got greedy, they they took the same they took the same uh, uh, attitude that the left has taken ever since it has pretty much uh, gotten into control of the culture wars in the U.S. and 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 that is to say that they cannot acknowledge their success because to succeed is to make themselves obsolete. That is why they will not they will not fix the the racial divides. That is why they will not address economic divides. That's why that they want to keep straight people and gay people fighting amongst each other. That is why they want to keep everybody split into smaller and smaller little groups of people that argue with each other over who has more right to what. That is is a big big problem. And the thing is, is that with Obama, the two came together as one. Their self-interest to maintain the state 
of being the status of things as it has become, which instead of fulfilling the promise that globalism initially presented, betrayed it. And that betrayal is trying to legitimize itself now. That is why we have come to the new paradigm that is taking shape. And it has finally asserted itself because it was delayed another eight years. Because of the, 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 the actually the forsaken promises of Obama. Now, whether or not he ever met them is another matter. I don't, I personally don't think so. I think that he was more involved with uh, the CIA than he was with any radical politics. Uh, quite, quite honestly, I think that uh, Billy Ayers and uh, Bernadine Dorn, his wife, I do believe were not, and I hate to say this, they were heroes of mine when I was a punk. But they, I, they, they, I do believe, it, it just seeing their influence right now uh, with Obama, right now, tells me that, that they were all together working for the CIA and not for world revolution. Uh, although, if there is a revolution, it, it's, uh, it's of a kind that we surely don't want to know about. Um, it's... Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, it's definitely not uh, not going to bring about any uh, help to the poor. We'll put it that way. What it is, it's going to keep the poor uh, dependent upon the, uh, the powers that be. And they are now part of the powers that be. So this betrayal, I, I think, is uh, uh, underlying a lot of what is going on right now. And it hasn't played all the way through yet. Uh, the black community has felt burned, and rightfully so. They've been, they've been suckered by the Democrats for a long time who don't want to solve their problem, but they, they just want to keep them going through the problem because by promising to do something and never doing it and saying we're the ones that care, this, uh, this uh, just, like, just like a... This is like an abusive relationship. You know, it, 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 it's like a guy that <laughs> treats his wife like crap, you know, and cheats on her and beats her and everything else. And it says, well, who loves you, baby? It's gaslighting. This is gaslighting. That, uh, that I think, is coming to an end. And th there are people that are, that are actually figuring it out. And... Uh, and it, it takes time. But, you know, the thing is, is that uh, LBJ was right. Uh, 50 years has been very doable. Uh, I don't think it's going to last 100. As a matter of fact, I think it's breaking up as we are going forward. The people that have, the people that have actually been saying, hey, look, uh, the Democrats have not been treating us well. What are they doing for us? What have they done for us lately? They've, they've caused uh, the black community to have more abortions than any other. But not only that, I, it, it, years ago when I first did the uh, American Amnesia Program, I went into some of the statistics on this. Not only that, but by not identifying the fathers, the identities of the fathers of the children that are aborted, You see where it goes. Why are fathers not important? That has been part of that. Uh, what kind of the children? A lot of black ministers know. And people aren't People aren't hiding from these facts any longer. They're looking at them. And well, they should. This is, this is very sinister. So that is, that is part of this big change. But it hasn't occurred yet. It is still, you can hear the groaning of the breakage as it's, as it's coming. 
and you can hear it. And when it snaps, it's going to be big. We're watching some really huge things breaking apart. And I'll tell you what, Mr. Obama might have a, have a place, a fortress right down the street from the White House. But he's not going to be able to stop it. And it's going to break on him. It's going to break on him hard. I'm going to tell you that right now. It says, but, but, go on with what Juan writes. Though. It says, what I see is the social construction of reality. Right? This is, this is something that a lot of people have been imposing on us. That, that reality is a social construct. Well, it, it is to a certain extent. But reality itself is not a construct whatsoever. It is, a, it is reality, and it will pop through that construct sooner or later. So it, it has been deinstitutionalized. Very important term here, what he's saying. The social construct of reality that they have made has been deinstitutionalized. It is re being removed not only from power, but it is also being perceived as being incorrect. And because of that, it is no longer the institution it had been. And decentralized. This is the second part of this idea here that is really key. And yeah, I agree with Juan 100% here. That what we have been seeing as the media... The media, the reason why the, the word media is a, is a plural for medium. They are between us and the real. Think about that for a second. They are between us, you and I, and the real. What is actually there? They are interpreting this to us for their own benefit to serve their masters because they are corporate shills they are working for large corporations and they're selling us a bill of goods ha 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 and that bill of goods is a manipulation of our reality They've been doing it over a hundred years at least. They've been doing it a long time. But the fact is that this is no longer institutionalized as it was, that, that we, we recognize NBC, CBS, CNN, and all of these are not the institution of the press. They are portions of the press because they have a press function i love the way uh, sticks goes into this they they do the function but they are not the thing itself they are one but one aspect each of this whole bigger thing there are many other places that do the function of the press including me including him Including Juan. Oh. Oh. Yeah. When you write the letter to the editor, you are participating in the freedom of the press. You have become part of the process. That is where it should be in the first place. But the fact is, is that in order to... Have, to actually participate in the freedom of the press, you must have access to one in the first place. Okay, so a press was a printing press at one time. Now it becomes, well, my computer here. It becomes uh, the TV station. It becomes a publishing house. It becomes anything that produces this mediated reality. Mm. Mm. They mediate. The media mediates. And it mediates and interprets what is real. Now, we as people interpret our perception 
is our personal reality. And, 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 and I think it's fair to say that each person's personal reality is, is different in a similar way. Okay, and you know, to kind of go to a, to an Auden-esque kind of idea, but but we each have this capacity of understanding and appreciating what we perceive as real, and that because of this, uh, there is no such thing as a primitive mind. I think of how how uh, condescending that idea is. What you have is the fact that each one of us potentially perceives reality differently, but there are generally things that we can say that we all share in common because we are human. And that we, actually, it is a certain amount of genius in, in order to uh, explain reality in a way that touches other people in a real way. That we often call those people artists. So when we talk about media, we are talking about art. We are talking about culture. We are talking about literature. We are talking about poetry. We're talking about books. We're talking about ideas, philosophy, religion, all the things that make life worthwhile. And when we entrust others to do that for us, uh, we are, at, at some level, negligent of, of a part of our own spiritual needs. To the extent that we let it go altogether uh, is, is tragic. But the thing is, is that the more that we allow them to, to define and manipulate reality that we should actually be interacting with on our own without their help, you know, we, we should rely on them for news, for raw data, and and even ideas maybe. You know, I mean, some of the bigger ideas. But the thing is, is that we should rationate with those ideas. We should take those ideas and, and, and weigh them, judge from them, and learn to, to perceive reality better on our own. That, 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 that makes the most sense to me. And, and we should be informed. This is how we are better citizens, is by being informed and by being knowledgeable. And, and I, think that, I think that we should not give that back to them. Uh, we should keep that decentralized. And he says, the previous manipulations have been amplified, equism really, uh, and exposed simultaneously. So that, that we know what they've done. And that's why the media's power has waned and is falling apart in front of our eyes today. Uh, and, and yeah, it's amplified. They are so cacophonous and, and caca, phony, sound of poop. <laughs> cacophonous, I love that word. Their sound is so cacophonous. Because they don't want us to think clearly. They want to cloud our thinking and have us go crawling back to them. Do not do that under any circumstance. It's time to break that down. And we're also exposing it. See, that that's the thing. Because it is being exposed, they're becoming louder. They, they have no other, they have nothing else to do. They have no other tactic left. The only thing they can do is insult us. And they're doing that. And they're trying their best to force the government to shut us up. Only they have the wrong government in place for that. See, that's the thing. The new paradigm is pushing its way in. It's not going to be denied. And it's changing everywhere. Just look around. In short, we are experience untruth fatigue. And now here's where I'm going to disagree. Yes, we are experiencing that, but the thing is, is that we're not falling down. We're the, they're the ones that are experiencing more fatigue. They've lied too much. They have nothing left. But the masses are asked as politics is beginning to fail as more people wake up out of the matrix. 
on the one hand, you uh, uh, have those who are new to freedom seeing the real, real reality with commensurate free will and critical thinking and discovering their true identity and role. And yes, people are doing this. I think what you have, uh, where, where the problem is, and, and Juan and I, and I have talked about this before, is that you have a large number of people who want freedom from freedom. They don't want to take up the responsibility it takes to be free people. And even worse, they insist on all of us being slaves because they don't want to assume the responsibility it requires to be free. And because if we do, then they're SOL. We're not going to feel sorry for their victimhood any longer. They have this big pity party that's been going on for a long time. And the biggest of the victims is the king of the hill. That's not going to happen anymore. This identity politics has come to an end. It's time for us to, to step up to Dr. King's dictum and let it be the quality of our character, not the color of our skin. Or the, the shading of any other thing. It's going to be the quality of who you are. Are you a decent human being or not? You know, it's good to be able to judge a person for being a jerk. Doesn't matter what color they are. This is freedom. This is freedom. And, and yeah, they don't, it's, there are people that don't want that. They, they're running from it. They're fighting hard. They'll punch you in the face and call you a fascist because they don't know what a fascist is. They really don't. They don't want to see it either. I don't want to see it. I haven't seen it for a long time. It did exist at one time. It's, it's kind of... I mean, you know, you got some skinheads out there, you know, living in the trailer parks, you know, that... You know, they're pretty scary guys. They're there. I mean, they're not what they used to be. They surely ain't what they used to be. And I'll tell you what, they, they used to be some pretty bad shit. So we see people blinking and they're kind of coming out of the hole. And they're seeing that, that there's a time to, to deal with that freedom. And it says here, and those that want to escape freedom, a la Eric Fromm. Uh, Replugging themselves into what they know is, is a grand illusion because it's more thoughtless and minimizes cognitive dissonance. And he's exactly right. Uh, Eric Fromm talked about this freedom from freedom, the escaping from freedom. Uh, I love Fromm. Uh, he, the, I, I don't always agree with what he, what he had to say, but you know, I always found him really thoughtful. You know, yeah, I'm okay, you're okay thing. I think was very uh, misinterpreted, but but from uh, also was looking at, 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 at the potential of the future society, and he uh, he brought up ideas like whatever became a sin. Sin is the great leveler. It really is. You know, people people who want to run from religion, well, you know, that's, I understand. But the thing is, is that sin, yeah, does it make you feel guilty? It should. There are things that are wrong that you should not do, and there should be some kind of a stigma that goes with it. And I think that is coming back in some form. Um, I think it's necessary. It, it's it's the great leveler. It's what brings people down to the level where they, we look at each other and go, you know, I know. I understand. Let's build back up. Because you have to do that to build back up. So that is that is what Juan is saying. That 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 this paradigm he he doesn't I don't agree that it's not here. I think it is. How, what exactly it's going to become, I don't know. 
but I think we see some of the contours now. And, and I think that he actually does too. And, uh, and what he has to say here, I, li I like what he had to say. I think I explained it well and completely. And we will look at uh, what this uh, future could turn into. What we need to see as far as change comes. Uh, because I'll, I'll tell you what, if the Democrats don't make some changes soon, they will become irrelevant. And it won't be too much longer before that happens. Right now, what you have in the, in, within their party, and, and they're trying to minimize uh, our, our, our investigation of this thing. But, but the fact is, is what you have is, is a huge schism between the left, the real left, and the pseudo left, which is basically your, your uh, SJW PC nonsense on the one hand, and the... Um, neoliberal, which is glommed onto the neoconservative kind of thing, that uh, just hasn't gone away yet, and and I don't think that that the that those two things are going to stay together, and I have I I have the feeling that the left is going to lose its patience with the SJW types. Uh, the the fact is is that identity politics is fail is a failure. It, it was it became a failure uh, partly because well actually it, it was kind of doomed anyway but but when when people were using the mislabeling of people as a racist because they didn't agree with Obama or they were using uh, the oh you must be uh, uh, misogynistic because you're not for Hillary this this kind of idiocy is gone. It, it it has lost any meaning anyway. It's been going on for many many decades, and it's about had it. And and people have about had it with this stifling PC. You know where it, you, you almost can't say anything anymore. It, it it's just a way of shutting people up. There is going to be a new discourse, and it's going to be direct, and it's going to be honest. Let it, let it be. Let people actually think. Don't try to suppress that. This freedom from freedom doesn't work. You will not escape it. You'll not escape reality. Reality will hunt you down. And sooner or later it will catch you. This has gotten to be very long. But, uh. I, I do like dealing with meta discourse, and uh, and I and I kind of bit off a, a bit much today, but I did want to finish this idea and and uh, and come kind of bring it to a conclusion, so that we can go forward and understand that this new paradigm is a new way of thinking and it's a new set of circumstances, and this is coming true around the world. It's not going to stop here. It's happening in Africa. It's happening in South America. It's happening in Europe, big time. It's happening in Russia. And, and Putin won't be able to stop it either. He might, he might get on board with it, but he can't stop it. It's happening in places in the Middle East. This, this new paradigm is arising. It is coming. And, and it looks like it, it's actually decentralizing. Imagine that. Imagine that. Until next time.